Amen. Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 24, if you would. Matthew chapter 24. And this morning for our text, we're going to read the first 12 verses of a powerful, powerful chapter, most all of it spoken from the lips of Jesus Christ. We're going to try to get most of these verses up on our screens. If you don't have your Bible this morning, feel free to, of course, look up there and look on with somebody near you. I'm sure they wouldn't mind. Matthew 24, verse 1. How many of you glad you came to church this morning? Say amen. 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 Me too. Verse 1. The Bible says, And Jesus went out, and he departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. A picture of this. It's Jesus, look at this. Look how impressive it is. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily, or truly, I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse or assorted places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And I want to point your attention most specifically to verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax or grow cold. The text we just read is taken from what has long been referred to as the Olivet Discourse. And Jesus delivered these sayings from the Mount of Olives. And here in Matthew chapter 24, we find him seated there speaking to his disciples about his second coming and the end of the world. Now, there's certainly a double application. Christ was talking about the impending doom of the Jewish temple that would come a few years later under the Roman emperor Titus. But there was a broader, more expansive application to the second coming of Jesus and the actual end of the world. And while I believe, and I think, I think we need to be careful to note this, while I believe that most of what Jesus said in this chapter was intended specifically for a Jewish audience relating to the seven-year tribulation period, notice he said, you're going to be hated of all nations for my name's sake. I believe that's the first primary application is to the Jews in the tribulation period. We can certainly apply what Jesus said to the times and the day in which we are living. Here's the thing. Jesus described these certain events as birth pangs. When his coming was soon When his coming was close, and and we've long taught from this pulpit that the rapture of the saints is imminent. It's overhanging. It can happen at any time. But Jesus said there are certain events like birth pangs that will happen with greater and greater frequency as the time draws near. Jesus said that in the last days, verse 6, there would be strife between nations. When you pick up your paper and turn on the news, do you see today's strife between nations? Jesus said that in the last days there would be hunger, 
disease and increasing cataclysmic events worldwide. Let me ask you this morning, are we seeing worldwide cataclysms like perhaps never before? Jesus said that in the last days there would be many false prophets, many religious deceivers that would lead their followers astray. If you know anything about our culture, if you know anything about the world scene, you know this is happening all over our world. But this morning I want to focus the remainder of our time together on another condition that will exist in the end times. And I've heard a lot of sermons about the conditions we just described. I've very seldom heard a sermon on this condition mentioned in verse 12 that Jesus said, listen, toward the end of it all, this is going to be happening all over the place. And here's what he said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. In the last days, iniquity will abound, Jesus says. That word iniquity in Greek means great wickedness or injustice. Literally, in some translations, uh, put it this way. It means lawlessness, casting off all parameters of God and man. And Jesus said this kind of lawlessness, this kind of rampant wickedness would abound. That word means to exist in great quantity. Jesus said, don't be shocked. Don't be surprised when things on earth are on the downhill slide, when depravity is spilling out all around you, when things seem like they're getting worse and worse. Jesus says, I'm telling you in advance that's going to happen. And friends, need I convince you? Need I I give statistics and details and depressing example after example about the fact that iniquity abounds in our world and in our nation? It's everywhere. The most dangerous problem, problem in America, listen, is not terrorism, it's sin. The most horrible disease in America is not AIDS. It's sin. Iniquity abounds. 2 Timothy 3, listen to this. This is, this is so vivid. I mean, it, it could absolutely be a headline for today's culture. Listen to 2 Timothy 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Are we seeing that in our culture? Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Jesus said in the last days, iniquity would abound, but then he said something that's a little more shocking. I mean, we expect to read descriptions from God, from Jesus, from the Bible about sin being everywhere, but then he says something a a little more subtle, because iniquity will abound, this is going to be one of the results, the love of many shall wax cold. But who are this loveless many? And that's no pun intended. By the way, isn't loveless like the greatest preacher name ever? I have people constantly ask me about that, like, like, loveless? Don't you mean love more? And I'm like, I've never heard that before. Thank you so much. <laughs> who are these folks? The, these that, because there's such wickedness, Their love is growing cold. They're withdrawing their affections. They're protecting their hearts. They're taking care of number one. The context indicates that they are the Christians that will be alive in that day. Because of the abounding iniquity, their love had grown cold. I want to bring you a message this morning entitled, Abounding Sin and Abating Love. You remember in Genesis when the Bible says that those flood waters abated? That means they started drawing back, abounding sin and abating love. 
Scientists tell us that cancer is a disease in which cells in your body begin to multiply without control. These multiplied cells form what is known as a tumor, and a malignant tumor will invade, compress, and eventually destroy all healthy tissue that it comes in contact with. There's no family in this auditorium that hasn't been touched by cancer, including mine, that hasn't seen its terrible destructive effects. And listen, when that tumor's there, you got to get it out. It'll destroy everything it comes in contact with. And listen, we are living in a very sinful world today. We're living in a world where iniquity abounds. It offers constant temptations, constant enticements. But Christian, once you allow sin to get into your lifestyle, once you give up that territory and say, you know what, I fought it long enough. If you can't beat them, join them. Once you've said in some or multiple areas of your existence, I'm going to stop the fight and just live. Just like that cancer, listen to me, it will grow. It will compress. It will eventually destroy, and here's what it will destroy, the love in your heart. When your life becomes infected with sin, it's very first target is your love. Well, we, you know, th- these last couple of series, we've had a lot to say about the adversary. We've had a lot to say about Lucifer, Satan, the dragon, all these names for him in the Scripture because we believe the Bible teaches he's not a force, he's not an idea, he's not a personification of evil. He's, he's, a, he's a person. He has a personality. He's a fallen angel. He is at work pulling the strings behind the scenes of things that you see here on earth. And he understands better than anyone that Christianity, listen, love is Christianity's driving force. It's the lifeblood of Christianity. It's the essential motive for everything we do to the point that God says, listen, I don't need all your ministries I don't need all your prayers. I don't don't need all the things you can offer me. What can you offer me? I'm God. If it's not done with love, I don't want it. Isn't that what he said in 1 Corinthians 13? Listen, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. In other words, I'm just making noise. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I'm nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. And now abides, or in other words, these remain, faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Greater than faith, Lord? Yes. Greater than hope? Yes, love. It's the lifeblood of Christianity. And in these wicked times, I wouldn't have to debate anybody in here that we're living in wicked times, right? Listen, your love, your affection is very much at risk. Let's talk about it this morning, abounding sin and abating love. I want to talk about three loves that are at risk in these wicked times. Here's the first one. Our love for him. Our love for God. Matthew 22, one of the most powerful sections of Scripture in the Bible. I mean, it's honestly just shocking that someone asked Jesus, Jesus, what's the cliff notes of the law? I mean, can you sum up the entire Old Testament in a statement? And, and, and we would think Jesus would say, absolutely not. Carry out the entire Old Testament. Jesus said, sure. And here's what he says. Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment and then love your neighbor as yourself. He said, that's the cliff notes of it all. You do those two, it it all works out. So when sin begins to abound in your life, your love for God begins to withdraw. 1 John 2.15, ooh, this is strong. Love not the world. Now when it says world, it doesn't mean 
the people of the world necessarily. It doesn't mean human beings. It doesn't mean the cosmos. It means the world system dedicated to wealth, pleasure, power, you know, this cultural thing that so many people wake up for every single morning. God says, don't be in love with that, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What does that mean? Listen, where your love for the world abounds, your love for God abates. A love for God and a love for the sinful world can't coexist. One always drives out the other. I won't ask you to raise your hand this morning, but I want want to give you an example. I wonder how many of you are in here today and you're in the middle of the summer and you're on a diet. Okay, I will not ask you to raise your hand. I am currently on the rotation diet. That means every time I turn around, I eat. So I've got to do something quickly or it's going to be bad. Some of you are on my diet with me, right? It's fun, man, very temporarily. But here's the thing, when you are, when your doctor or your trainer or whoever puts you on that low-fat, low-carb, low-fun diet, right, when you start out, man, isn't the food you're eating so distasteful, like, it just doesn't taste like that other stuff. Like the salt and the fat and the grease and the fried and right, and this is just so bland and it just it doesn't taste good. You know what? Stick with it a while, and things start changing, right? It starts tasting better. You start feeling better, right? You don't get rickets. It's amazing. You know, eat some vegetables. It's great. And it's like when you do that, it starts changing over. And if you eat like that for six months. Then you like head down to Double Dave's and hit up the buffet. It'll make you sick. Why? Things have changed. How many of you tuning in with me? Say amen. A Christian who loves the Lord and is walking with Christ. They're not perfect. There's no perfect one anywhere but they're reading this book regularly. They're spending time talking to God, maybe not like they should, no one does it like we should, but they're on their knees talking to God regularly. They're in the house of God with God's people regularly. They're ministering regularly. They're doing what we talk about every week. They're seeing God, sharing life, and serving others. Let me just tell you something. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. They will find the things of this world distasteful. They'll be very sensitive to things that are wicked, to things that are filthy, to things that are... They'll turn on the television when something perverse comes on. They'll pick up on it. It'll be offensive. It'll rub you the wrong way. Right? Why? You're walking with Christ. You're in that mode. But on the other side of this, oh, and by the way, a Christian who loves the Lord and is walking in fellowship with Christ finds sin distasteful. It doesn't mean they can't do it. It doesn't mean it loses all attraction. Don't get me wrong. But you lose your appetite for it. Now, you can still sin, but at least initially it'll make you sick. But let me talk about the other side of that. If you're a Christian and you've been living for a long time, a long way away from Jesus, the old timers called that condition being backslidden. I'm not spending any time in this. My my attendance in the house of God is hit and miss. My time with the people of God is is, is non-existent. I, I hardly ever pray except when I'm in trouble. If that's where you're living, and by the way, we love you. We're not here to condemn you. We've all been there, okay? This preacher, I still wrestle with moving back there if I'm not careful. Other than missing church, because that looks super weird if I just don't show up for large sections of time. But here's the thing. Show me somebody living like that. Let me tell you what they find distasteful. Church services that go five minutes over. Let me tell you what they find distasteful. Reading this at all. 
And by the way, let's, let's pl- I don't mean to offend you. Let's please do away with this thing of I just don't like to read. Especially if you're in the younger generation. Really? We are the most texting, twittering, Facebooking generation that's ever. You read 24 7. You don't have a taste for this. The things of God have become distasteful to you. I don't know that I need it, but let me give you another example. You ever walk into a movie theater or a dark something on a really bright day, right? And you get inside and it's just like so dark. You can't even make your way around. You're just practically blind. Spend two hours in there and then come back out into that sunshine, right? It's blinding. Here's what happens, and it's so subtle. It's so subtle. If you're a Christian, you have a new heart for God. You love Jesus. I'm telling you, there's one great proof. If you don't have a heart that at some point fell in love with Jesus, you're not a Christian. I don't care whose dotted line you signed. God gives you a new heart for Jesus. That's that's the definition of a new birth is a profound change of heart toward God. It makes you have a heart that loves other believers. We start out like that, but listen, if we don't feed it, we drift, and it's so subtle, man, that one day you get up and you don't feel like reading. That couple of occasions where you miss church, and I'm telling you, listen, when you get in the habit of missing church, isn't it so much easier to miss the next one? It's the easiest thing in the world. There is no Sunday on earth like sleeping in like Sunday, or excuse me, no day of the week like, like Sunday for sleeping in. I'm just going to back up. That's all messed up. <laughs> I tried to back my way around into that. You know what I'm saying, right? Sunday's a beautiful sleep-in day. The devil sees to it. You say, well, you're kind of overstating it. Am I? How do you explain somebody being on fire for Jesus Christ and three months later they can't stand anything about seeking him? Your love for God is at risk. A Christian living in sin falls out of church and out of the Bible and out of love with God because those things are too bright. They've grown accustomed to the darkness. Let me give you the second thing. In these wicked times, our love for God must be guarded. Secondly, our love for the church. Now, let me, let me be very clear on this. When I talk about the church, I'm not talking about a building. People very often, well, I'm going to church today, and, it, and it's like I'm heading to that auditorium. That's not what I mean by church. And we're not talking about a particular denomination, Baptist, Methodist, whatever. When I talk about church, I'm talking about an assembly of people gathered together around Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10, 24 says it like this. Let us consider one another to provoke and to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Church, listen, church is that wonderful place where you get to meet together with your brothers and sisters in Christ to sing songs about Jesus and hear words about Jesus and hear sermons about Jesus. Every single piece of it's about Jesus. And a love for the brothers, a love for the sisters, a magnetic attraction to them, a love being around God's people has always been the hallmark of a true believer. 1 John 13, 34, let me give you some scripture. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love also one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. In other words, if you're a Christian, here's an easy way to tell if you're saved. There's this magnetic pull to other believers. You you just want to be around them. 1 John 3, 14, we know that we've passed from death to life. How? Because we love the brethren. He that loves not his brother abides in death. But when sin begins to abound in your life, love for your brothers and sisters in Christ begins to abate. When a Christian begins to slide back, we've all done it. One of the first things to go is their church family. Man, we ought to be honest in church, right? Can I get an amen? If there's any place we ought to get real and be honest, it's here. 
Maybe you're here today and you used to be a faithful member of, of this church or some other church. I mean, you showed up every time the doors were open. You were like crashing deacon meetings, you know, just showing up when you weren't supposed to. By the way, there's no one more, more exciting to be around for a preacher oftentimes than a brand new member of a church. They are so excited to be there. They just, they love it. They can't wait to be with God's people. You remember that? You remember when that was you? You attended every time the doors were open. You taught that class or sang in the choir or you served other people in some ministry. You had this love for God and a love for people and you couldn't wait to get to church. But now, now, you show up on a Sunday morning sometimes. You have no part in ministry, though God has given you the gifts that he's given all of his, ch his children. Your love for the brethren has grown cold. There's not that magnetic pull anymore. If you make it, fine. If you miss it, fine. And honestly, a thousand other hobbies and pursuits take a place of precedent over the house of God. I, you know what? I, I know it's like politically incorrect to even say that now. Like we're supposed to just, you know, as the church, we're supposed to just kind of take what we get, take the leftovers, and be happy you got that. I'm telling you, I think we have begun to minimize the local church in our American culture. And Jesus Christ said that the church is his body. Christ is the head, the church is his body. Man, alive, the people who are out there saying, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. Can you imagine husbands going home and saying to your wife, Honey, I love your head, but I hate your body. Christ is the head, and, and the church is his body. Christ died for the church. He shed his blood for the church. Friend, listen, whenever you stop feeling that magnetic pull to be all in with a congregation. Let me just encourage you, examine your heart and your life for idols. What is getting your attention? What is claiming your affection? What is pulling you away? How many still with me? Say amen. There are three loves that are at risk in wicked times. Our love for God, our love for the church, and finally our love for the lost. When I use the term lost, I, I simply use that term to describe someone who does not yet know God. They've never been born again. They've never been given a new heart through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And this third point, y'all, applies in a whole different way. It applies to a whole different group of people. You remember in our text, Jesus is speaking of the end times. And in those end times, the love of many will get cold because iniquity will abound. Our first two points applied to people who are kind of drawn into the iniquity and thus they lose their love for God and his church. It becomes distasteful. But I believe there's a third group. Oh, man. A group of dedicated believers who find themselves so disturbed and disgusted by the sinful conditions around them, they lose their love for sinners. Those who begin to isolate themselves from the world. If the truth be known, they actually begin to hate the world. I meet people who almost seem excited about lost people going to hell. Oh, listen. I think it's easy, I think it's really easy to get scared especially if you lived in days where America's doing better, was doing better than it's doing now. I think it's really easy to watch enough TV and read enough newspapers to just get terrified. And so you insulate yourself and you back away from the world and you back away from what used to be ministry for you. Friend, here's the thing. The depraved world around us deserves hell. 
But let's please always remember this. So do you. And so do I. There's not a single person in here that has earned what you've got with Almighty God. If you're here you are, and, and you're breathing in this place, you're as guilty before a holy God. You're as hopeless. You're as depraved. You're as deserving of judgment as you could possibly be. But Jesus Christ, the Bible says, died for sinners. He died for you. He brought you back. And there's no one so far gone in this place or in this world that Jesus can't rescue them. Didn't the Bible say this in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. If anybody had reason to hate the world, it was God. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Ladies and gentlemen, we ought to hate sin. We ought to hate it. It's destructive. It steals our affection. It's, it, it, it is never, the devil never intends that thing he offers you for your good. He always intends to crush you with it. He'll give you the apple, but he'll choke you on the core. He'll give you the money, but it'll be counterfeit money. He never plays games with you. He always aims for the jugular. We ought to hate sin. Man, we ought to love sinners because they're us. In Scotland some years ago, and I'm done, before matches were even a thought, I'm told that the fires went out in a certain community. And all of the neighbors began to search for a home where smoke was still curling from the chimney. And finally on a hillside they found one little cottage where the fire was still burning hot. And so presently they all came around to get a shovel of coals to carry back to their own blackened hearths. And after a while the flames were burning all over the neighborhood. Listen, the fire is going out all over the place today. People's love is growing cold for God and the things of God. And in this country, y'all, some of the things that we call blessings might be more accurately called tests. That money in the bank account that God allowed us to have is not just a blessing, it's a test. Living in this country with all of its freedoms and all of its resources and all of its options is a test. God help us to stay so close to Jesus that our hearts stay hot, that our affections stay on fire. Next Sunday, God willing, we're going to talk about exactly how to have this red hot love for Jesus and how to keep those fires burning but I tell you this morning just studying this was convicting and maybe for you it's convicting and it's not to make you hopeless it's not to make you beat yourself up there's only one purpose of this conviction that God gives us it's to bring us to repentance. It's to bring us to the place where we say, oh, Lord, I can't do it. I don't trust myself. You know how faulty I am. You know how frail I am. God, if it's left up to me, I'll never follow you for long. You know what, friend? When you're in that position to admit those things, oh, you're in a healthy place because you can come and say, Lord Jesus, I need a Savior, not just to save my soul, but to save my life, to work in me now for your good pleasure. Let's all stand. Brandon's coming. We're going to have a verse of invitation. And if no one needs to come, we won't tarry long. But I, 
I'm just betting there's somebody like me. When you hear a message like this, no matter the speaker, no matter the style, the content, which I'm absolutely convinced is biblical, that everything rises and falls on a love for Jesus that spills over into a love for others. Hey, listen to me. If you're getting a little cold, if you've gotten a little cold, if everything else in the world makes you excited, but Jesus is, frankly, the whole idea of him and his word and his people and his service is distasteful. Friend, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. That is not the normal Christian life. There's something wrong, but it can be made right. Nobody can do it for you. Listen, this preacher can't do that for you. And your wife can't do it for you. And your kids can't do it for you. And your parents can't do it for you. You've got to get real with God. If you're cold, tell him so. Oh, God, help us to be on fire. Help us to be on fire. I'm going to pray for our entire congregation and pray for our kids going to camp this week that God will light a fire. And if you need to come down, these altars are here. There's nothing magical about this, but sometimes you need to move. Sometimes you need to grab your family and come down and pray together. Sometimes you need to pray with a counselor, and you can do that if you come. Let me know. But all over this place, we're going to get real quiet, and we're going to turn the lights down a little bit. And, and, and please, if, if, if you can be just as stationary as possible so we don't distract anybody, let's spend some time with God right here, right now. Lord, thank you for this moment. You know my heart. God, nobody here knows me like you know me. I don't know me like you know me. And thank you for being so gracious. And Father, help me in the areas where I've gotten cold and lax. Forgive me and work in me to know that great passion of what it is to be in love with you and serving you. And Lord, all of us have so many excuses, a, a, a thousand reasons why we're not on fire, but there's really only one reason. God, help us to repent of that and be yours today. We thank you for what you're going to do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.